Now, for this evening's uh, discussion, I'm delighted that we have with us uh, Dr. Drew Endy, who uh, works uh, in a laboratory concerned with uh, an emerging area of science and technology. If you listen to some of what our president, Susan Hockfield, says about key areas of modern research and innovation, one of the things that she talks about quite often is the convergence of the biological sciences, from which, as it happens, she comes, and engineering, which, as it happens, is something MIT knows quite a lot about. And the convergence of biology and engineering, which have not always been subjects seen as being closely related, is, it's clear, one of the key areas for innovation in the early 21st century. Drew Endy is right at that interface. He works in an area known as biological engineering. It's not yet a department uh, as such in MIT. Who knows, perhaps in the near future it may be. But he works in an area in which people are applying engineering principles to the creation of novel and potentially useful uh, biological uh, organisms. So he tells me that he is also involved in a startup company uh, which is involved in trying to commercialize uh, the synthesis of DNA with useful properties in synthetic biology. So he wanted to declare that as an interest. And you might want to find out more about what his company is doing. That's up to you. But in the meantime, I'm delighted that Drew Endy is here. And if I could locate him. Oh, I can. There he is. He's going to come and take my place. Drew, welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, for everybody who is uh, joining us tonight, as you can see, I'm hoping this will be quite informal. Uh, I do plan to maybe talk for 10 or 15 minutes. If you'd like to interrupt as I'm talking and ask a question uh, at that time, just to clarify, let's, let's definitely do that. Um, and we'll get started. So uh, by way of introduction, I'm an engineer, really. So my undergraduate degree is in civil engineering from Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, where I studied structural design. Reinforced concrete, bridges, steel, uh, wastewater treatment, that sort of thing. Um, and so what I'm interested in as a person is I'm interested in building stuff. I like to make things. That's what I do. Um, and so I thought what I'd talk about in starting our, our conversation this evening is to talk about how we build biological systems. If you think about the physical world, biological systems are part of that world. And just like other objects, like everything in this building and the building itself, part of the physical world where we can construct stuff. So it's also true in biology, in the living world, that aspect of our physical world that we can design and build stuff. And what's interesting about the interface of biology and engineering today is that we're revisiting the tools and technologies, the foundations by which we design and build biological systems. So the transition to think about this in a big scale is we're going from looking at the living world as only coming from nature to a subset of the living world being produced by engineers who design and build new, useful, hopefully useful, uh, living artifacts according to our specifications. So how is it that we currently design and build biological systems? So about 30 years ago, there was the discovery of enzymes called restriction enzymes that basically let you cut and paste with some other enzymes, cut and paste DNA at very specific points. And this was the beginnings of what was called recombinant DNA technology. You could take one piece of DNA from an organism over here, cut it out, take a piece of DNA from an organism over here, also cut it out, and then splice it together to make a new chimeric molecule of DNA. As a new technology, so 30 years ago, there were concerns about its accidental misapplication. And there's also a lot of excitement around its constructive application. So one of the very early examples of that technology was the cloning of the gene uh, for insulin, the gene that expresses and produces insulin. Um, from humans, placing that into bacteria so bacteria could be used uh, to produce a drug uh, to treat a disease in humans. You could also imagine taking that same technology and cloning genes that confer antibiotic resistance into bacteria that infect humans and making antibiotic resistant bacteria. Right? And if you look over the last 30 years, what we've seen is very few, if any, people have been doing that purposefully to cause harm, whereas a large number of people have been thinking about how to um, recombine existing pieces of DNA to do useful things. Now, from an engineering perspective, cutting and pasting DNA is great, but it's a very limited technology. 
And it depends on having access to the physical material that you can cut and paste from, and the knowledge and skills and know-how, the lore, uh, which is accessible via the guild-like structure of the science of biology, uh, so you can learn how to do this. So what are the new things uh, that are coming online that make it easier for us to think about designing and building biological systems? There's four new inventions. And I'm going to argue that each of these inventions by themselves is as significant as recombinant DNA technology was 30 years ago. Uh, the first invention is DNA synthesis. So DNA synthesis is a chemical process by which you start with sugars derived from sugar cane, bottles of raw materials, and you hook them up to a machine, and then you feed in information, A's, T's, C's, and G's, genetic information into this machine, and out of the machine comes a physical piece of DNA. So if we were to have four bottles of A, T, C, and G, the bases that make up DNA, and then feed information into a machine, out of that machine would come DNA itself. So has anybody seen uh, Star Trek? Um, which everybody must have seen Star Trek, right? So, so there are these things in Star Trek called matter compilers, where they get their food out of this little cubby in the wall, and the food just materializes, right? Um, a DNA synthesizer is a matter compiler for genetic material, right? So in comes information, in comes the raw sugars, out comes DNA. This is pretty cool if you're a would-be biological engineer, because it means if you want a piece of DNA, you get the sequence information from a computer database, and you send it over the internet to your DNA synthesizer, and the DNA synthesizer spits out the DNA. So the chemistry for doing this was invented in 1982, and people got pretty good at making short little fragments of DNA, maybe 40, 60, 100 units long, 100 nucleotides long whereas a gene might be a 1,000 nucleotides long. But about six years ago, the engineers came in, back to the interface that was mentioned between engineering and biology, and started investing in the process uh, wrapped around the chemistry so that DNA synthesis would become easier and easier and easier. So you can think about what photocopying has been like, for example, where the original photocopiers sort of worked, and they always broke, and they have gotten better over time and smaller and more reliable. That's what's happening with our synthesizers. So the cost of synthesizing long fragments of DNA has dropped by a factor of two each of the last four years. So it's gone from $16 a base pair when I first moved to MIT, so it means a gene would cost you as much as a Volkswagen, $16,000, uh, to $8 to $4 to $2 to about a dollar today. So I can buy a gene built from scratch for less than the price of, a, of, well, about the price of this thing here, maybe a little bit less. And it looks like that price is going to drop by a factor of two for the next three years, right? So this transition is very interesting at a couple different levels. One, it makes it easier for me, an engineer, who doesn't want to spend my entire life pipetting and using these restriction enzymes to cut and paste DNA. It means I can just ask somebody for the DNA. I can be a designer. I can be a designer of a biological system. Somebody else can be a, a builder, right? So in architecture, right, somebody is an expert designer of a building and then a contractor is an expert um, a constructor of a building, right? So that separation is quite important. The other thing to think about is we no longer care primarily about access to the material. We care about access to the information. And we're familiar in other domains what happens when uh, we go through this sort of transition. So if you think about music, we went from storing music on vinyl or wax before then, then vinyl, then tape, right? And eventually we had digital music, MP3s, we have the iTunes store on Apple, right? And all of a sudden, we're sharing and making use of music at the information level. Well, with synthesis of DNA, we're enabling the same transition. We can go from uh, sharing physical genetic material. I can have a minus 80 freezer in my lab. We can sh ship things back and forth between other labs to now I have a database on the web. And I can share the information freely online. That's going to have consequences uh, for the economics of, of investment in de inventing new genetic functions how they get shared, how they get reused. It's also going to have impacts on security, right? So for example, there are publicly accessible databases where you can get the sequences that encode human pathogens. Ebola as one example. Smallpox is another example. These are two uh, of the, the most critical examples because both Ebola and smallpox are not physically accessible to most people. If you wanted to get a physical copy of smallpox, you would have to go break into the lab at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta or go over to Russia and pick it out of the, the uh, uh, ex-Soviet Union facility. If you wanted to get Ebola because the natural reservoir of the virus isn't known, you would have to find an outbreak, risk death collecting a sample. Um, 
But in the case of synthesis coming online, you can go to a database. We won't go through the example today, right? But you could you find the genome of Ebola, uh, put that into your synthesizer, and construct it. And then you'd have the trick of turning that into a virus, but you could work that out. So this idea that we now have this new technology of synthesis lets us go from information to material. And if you've been coming to these before, you would have heard about the sequencing projects, which is the complementary technology letting us go from material, reading out genetic material and producing strings of DNA information. Right? Now we have these two uh, pathways mapped out. We can go from material to information and back to material, which means that genetic material and genetic information are one and the same. And that becomes ever more so going forward. So that's technology number one that's new. Makes it a lot easier for us to be biological engineers, or at least learn how to do that. The three other technologies I'll go through more quickly. Um, the first of the set, these are all going to be engineering technologies. The first is called standardization. Standards. We don't have any standards in biology to first approximation. If you think about standards and the importance of standards in the context of engineering, it's hard to actually get access to the examples because they're so old. I'll give you one. In the United States in 1860, there weren't any standards for screw threads. So if you wanted to buy a mechanical object, you'd buy it from a machinist. And when it broke, you had to go back to that shop to get it repaired because the screws and whatnot uh, specific to the machine you bought were produced on the, the machines within that shop and, and tooled up to whatever designs they had for screws. In 1864, in April, at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, a fellow by the name of William Sellers argued for standardization of screw threads in the United States. And he said screw threads should be 60 degree angles squared off at the top, because that's going to be really easy to make. This is a, a technical argument. We had to get the design right, but it was also a political argument. He had to get all of his colleagues, all the machinists, to retool their machines in accordance with the standard. As a result of doing that, if you buy a machine from somebody, it breaks, you can get it fixed by anybody else's machine shop. We don't have standards for constructing DNA. We don't have standards for how proteins bind DNA, controlling the reading out of information. We don't have standards for measuring something inside a cell. We don't have standards, and so on and so forth. So the entire field of biological engineering to first approximation is starting from scratch and building out a foundational infrastructure uh, based on standards. Two more examples. Um, so again, as a result, right, if you look at what's going on in all of these things here, right, these robots, you wouldn't see robots, objects constructed by humans of this complexity if there weren't some basic standards by which you could get the raw parts and put them together. Two more quick examples. Um, abstraction. Abstraction is a weird one to talk about. Um, and if there wasn't so much tape around stuff. Well, let's try it this way. Abstraction is this idea that it would be useful to um, hide information and manage complexity so that when we try and build more powerful objects, more sophisticated objects, all heck doesn't break loose. And the way we deal with this in engineering is to physically reconstruct and reconfigure stuff from nature so that it's easier to deal with. Here's an example. This is from uh, uh, Jerry Sussman in electrical engineering at MIT. So you'll see that I'm changing this wire. And as I'm doing this, there's an interesting magnetic field that's changing, right? Um, and we could try and model that and simulate this extraordinarily complex physical system. Um, we could start with quantum electrodynamics or something like that. Uh, and it's going to matter what the temperature of the room is, whose mine the material in the wire comes from. Is it Bob's mine number 32 in Kentucky or Drew's mine number 23 in Pennsylvania? Um, it's going to matter whether I'm holding it around here and stuff like this. And it's really an interesting problem to work on. Um, but you'll note that as I'm doing this and as I'm talking about it, the microphone's still working, right? And so somehow we've been able to take this raw material from nature and reconfigure it by refining it, by adding insulation to the wire, by making its properties and uses more regular. Um, we've been able to reconfigure it so that it's quite simple to use. We've hidden all of the details we could wonder about, where the material came from, right? So that we don't have to worry. We don't have to sweat the details. How do we do something like that in a substrate as complicated as biology? Is biology actually complicated? 
We have no idea. Uh, everybody says it is, but we've never tried to refine it, process it, package it up anew. So could you start to design synthetic proteins, synthetic parts that make it easier to put stuff back together? The idea here is I understand it, and I have to admit I didn't know I wanted abstraction until three years ago when Jerry Sussman taught it to me, is if you think about people are all excited about biology engineering, biology engineering, what's that all about? Well, think about what the Stone Age was about. The Stone Age, from an engineering perspective, was we're going to collect rocks and boulders and everything lying about the countryside, and we're going to start to refine them. We're going to make building blocks. And the reason we're going to do this is so when we go to make a building, it's easier, right? And the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and so on. What we're doing is we're collecting raw materials from nature, refining and repackaging them so that their use in making new things is simpler and more reliable. So we've got synthesis, we've got standardization, we've got abstraction. And we're working on all of these things. The last one I already mentioned, so I won't spend much time on it. This idea of decoupling. I'll be an expert designer, you be an expert gene synthesizer, we'll work together, right? We can each be experts in our own domain without having to be a master of everything. So right now, if you're doing genetic engineering, you have to be an expert in everything. You have to understand the biology, you have to understand the cloning, you have to understand how to measure it, you have to understand the licensing rights, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, I thought what I'd do, if we could switch over, I wanted to show you one picture of what's happened as we've begun to invent and deploy um, some of these technologies. Uh, yeah, yeah. We want to go, actually, if you can not, no, oh, don't do that. Click, oh boy. Try like slide down some more. No, no, about 30, 36. Keep going. Uh, 42, let's try. Next one. Sorry, it's really 44, that's what I mean. <laughs> right. So what happens as you start to make the engineering of biology easier? It's pretty simple. People start to engineer biology. Um, so in this case, what you're looking at is a, a, a lawn of bacteria, a plate, 10 by 10 centimeters of bacteria. They've been engineered by a group of students down in Texas, a high school dropout, a bunch of undergrads, one graduate student. The high school dropout, by the way, is independently wealthy because he made his own computer software company. Um, so this is a 10 by 10 centimeter lawn of bacteria, and they've engineered it with four standard biological parts, very early first generation standard biological parts, so that the individual bacteria on this plate are sensitive to light. And so that when light comes into the plate, the bacteria change color. In other words, the bacteria on this plate are acting as photographic film, but in this case, living photographic film. So when you shine a picture, in this case, a fellow named Andy Ellington, a professor down in Texas, the bacteria take his picture. So this is an example of a student project done over a period of a summer where by making the engineering of biology easier, you can start to do stuff more quickly and more reliably, and the folks who do it um, don't have to be experts working in labs at MIT or elsewhere. So that's what I wanted to say from the standpoint of technology development. In service of, of, of giving you some stuff to think about, from my perspective as I've encountered this work, um, we've come across four different societal issues. The first issue is the issue of risk and security. Who's going to be engineering biological systems? Can we trust them? Is it only going to be us? Who is us? Are people going to actually synthesize pathogens from scratch? Or is that never going to happen? Do we have to worry about that? Do we have to worry about the remilitarization of biological technologies? Right? So that's already happened once in the last 100 years. And we've thankfully stopped it quite recently. What would it look like if we started that up again with modern technology? It would not look good. So that's class of issues number one. Second class of issues. What do people think about this? Should we be doing it? Is it understandable? What are folks' perceptions? Part of my family, uh, my relatives are um, uh, devout Roman Catholic. I have a formidable collection of ants. And when I go home and they ask me what I'm doing, uh, the question that we end up with is, what's wrong with the DNA that God gave us? 
And I have some answers to that, but they're my answers, and they're, you know, they're different. Um, so what about that? Uh, third class of issues. These students are taking four, excuse me, five parts, five low-level biological functions, and piecing them together in some novel way. Now, four of the functions had actually been designed by students at MIT in the preceding two years, and the fifth function had been designed by a student at UC San Francisco. And these folks down in Texas were really just system integrators, putting everything together. Technically, they had to be able to do that, but also they had to be able to do that legally. They had to be able to share and reuse these components in some novel way. That's not typical in biotechnology today. Usually what happens is that the individual low-level functions or classes of functions are owned by different groups or, fun or, or, or companies. So it's very hard to bring things together. We don't have a commons of, of biological functions that we can reuse. So that's class of issue number three, the economics of this. And then the fourth one is, is the organization of the community itself, the set of people who are doing this. Is it going to be only the biologists, only the biological engineers, only the academics? Is there going to be, like there is in civil engineering, the American Society of Civil Engineers? Do, are we going to have the American Society of Biological Engineers? Are these folks going to be responsible for the work? Should we be signing our work? Um, do we need to publicize our plans? And so on. Um, so none of these issues is, is well worked through, which is fine because the technology itself is still early on in its development. But you can hopefully get a sense for where things might be going. Yes, sir? Just, just, is there a reason to think that this matters? It's a good issue we can come back and talk I mean, about. Like, you know, take that example. One can, there's other ways, there's other ways to, to get that this effect. Can you think of something? That, that would want to use this, that, that would use your, your pathway, that you couldn't do more easily than some other pathway. So the heart of the question you're raising is, why would you be interested in developing biological technologies at from all an from an engineering perspective? Um, and so why don't I take a couple minutes and outline the application space? And I'll start with this. Uh, this is a toy project, but I think it's also an interesting path towards an application. So let's say you wanted to um, produce materials, inorganic materials, on very small length scales. Right? If you look at where semiconductor manufacturing is going, we are starting to care about the precise placement of dopant molecules in semiconductor materials. And we can't rely on random distribution of those. Biological systems are quite good at controlling the positions of atoms. Um, here we've got bacteria. Bacteria are a micron, which means that there's a billion of them per square inch. Right? Um, we can control individual bacteria with light. Um, by controlling individual bacteria with light, we can program what they're doing. Note that bacteria are reproducing machines that make more of themselves and have sophisticated chemistry at their disposal. Um, there's a paper on the cover of Nature this week where people are taking DNA, which can be excreted from these bacteria, and using that to assemble two-dimensional shapes. So what I'm showing you here, right, from the student project, is part of a technology platform that competes with lithography, right? But in this case, you immediately have access across tens of centimeters to a materials fabrication length scale of three nanometers. Um, not bad uh, for an out-of-the-box project by a bunch of students. Some of the other applications, one that I'm particularly interested in is information processing, like what computers do. Um, but in this case, I'm not interested in replacing silicon computers what I'd like to do is implement very modest amounts of memory and logic as genetically encoded memory and logic. So for example, I'd like to have uh, an 8-bit counter that counts up to 2 to the 8th, a counter that counts up to 256. Um, and I'd like this to be a genetically encoded counter made out of proteins and DNA. And if I had such an object, I would put it inside every cell in my body. And every time the cell divided, I would increment the counter by 1. And after a time, if it divided too many times, I would ask that cell to die, right? Or I would use a counter to study aging, right? Uh, I don't have memory and logic under my control inside living systems. And silicon isn't going to get us there anytime soon. So implementing memory and logic in a new domain, in a place where I don't have memory and logic under my control, in this case, the living world, is extraordinarily compelling. Other classes of applications without giving a yeah. Carcinoma? 
if you wanted to be pie in the sky, I think the immediate application is a research tool. Right? So if you look at, for example, how people study aging in yeast, in Baker's yeast, it's a nice model organism used for studying aging. Uh, when yeast cells, Baker's yeast, Baker's yeast or brewer's yeast grow and divide, the daughter cell buds off from the mother and it leaves behind a scar. And so if you look at an old mother yeast cell, it'll have rings of chitin, these little bud scars around uh, the surface of the cell. And you can stain these with a dye called calcaflor. And then you can look at the yeast under a microscope. And then you can count the number of scars. This is not unlike cutting a tree and counting the rings. right? Um, and so the way you study aging in yeast is to collect yeast of different age by counting the number of bud scars under a microscope. You can imagine this becomes extraordinarily tedious and isn't easy to automate. Um, if we had a genetically encoded counter that worked inside yeast, we could use the counter to tell, have the yeast tell us how old they are by controlling combinations of glowing proteins. And then we could sort them into vast quantities of cells of different ages. So modest amounts of memory and logic implemented in places where we have none is a huge return, initially for the research. Um, but if it worked, uh, you would imagine wanting to apply it in some of the uh, applications you're hinting at. Materials fabrication, information processing, chemical processing, energy production, although I don't believe that one, everybody's trying to do it in today's uh, uh, climate. Um, health is another. Um, um, so so I, think, I think there's, you know, if you think of biology not as a science, but biology as a technology and ask what do biological systems do, that defines the realm of possibility, then how do we realize engineered biological systems that do those things for us? Thank you very much. Drew, splendid. OK, as we said, now it's over to you. So I'd like you, if you will, please, to get into huddles. I, I saw a whole group of folk of what looked to my eye like roughly maybe people who knew each other. So if you can split up so you're not in groups of buddies, that would be better because you'll probably uh, have a more interesting time. Um, but for about 10 minutes, could you brainstorm which of the fascinating issues Drew has raised you'd like to discuss, what, which questions you'd like to explore? And please, in your group, write down the one or at most, I think, a couple of ideas that you come up with as a group on the cards which are available on each of the tables. We'll go and collect those after a few minutes, and then we'll reconvene. Thank you. Uh, let me just read out a few of the first questions that John's put up. These are from you. Could a 1% misuse of synthetic biology or synthesis technology, Ebola, for example, destroy the possible 99% positive uses? In other words, is one misuse going to wipe out all the potential uh, good uses of this area? How long until someone's biology is changed? For example, a diabetic person producing their own <coughs> insulin. Uh, how does Drew Endy answer? His aunts, if you remember, he talked about having a lot of aunts who thought that God had done a fairly good job with our DNA now. Um, how does he answer that question? He did imply in what he said at the beginning that he had some answers to that. So we should, someone's asking him to stand and deliver, or sit and deliver. He seems to want to sit down here. Um, how do we prevent misuse or accidental freeing of devastating molecules? Who will set the standards? It's interesting that quite a lot of these early questions are actually in the two first categories of issue that, Drew, I think you mentioned. One to do with risk and potential for misuse. One to do with, if you like, morality, the question, ought we to be doing this kind of thing? One of you in the discussion as we, I was roaming around said that you were reminded of a comment that uh, Oppenheimer made when he watched the atom bomb exploding. And Oppenheimer, I think, uh, quoted from the Upanishads, the Indian sacred scriptures. And I forget the exact wording, I'm ashamed to say, but it was something to do that now, as it were, we are, have become gods. I think that was the gist of it. But with the feeling that maybe we ought not to have done. Are we becoming, as it were, gods in our aspirations for what we do with life? So there's quite a lot about risk, and there's quite a lot about ethics here. Um, and then there's a whole lot more, which I'm not going to read out, because this is not meant for me to spend a lot of time on. So. Drew, I think you might want to say something about risk. Uh, let's go back to the first one, then. <laughs> if that was the easier one, it would be more interesting to stick to the first one. I think we should say you might want to say something about the issue of risk. I mean, it is worth just saying that 
30 or so years ago, Cambridge Mass was quite exercised about the question whether a facility for recombinant DNA technology should be permitted in Cambridge because, principally, because at that time of fears about what might be done with the old cut and splice technology with which, Drew, you started your talk. Why should we be comfortable with those issues today when people weren't so comfortable with them apparently 30 years ago? And then perhaps we could say a bit about the ethics. Okay. Please. <laughs> Sorry. You did, you did volunteer, though. So <laughs> these are really good questions. I don't know that I can answer them. Um, could a 1% misuse destroy 99% positive use? Not, maybe. Um, could a 1% misuse of hammers destroy 99% positive use of hammers? Conceivable. Um, it's hard for me to evaluate what the consequences of 99% positive use are. Uh, let me be specific. Um, if you walk through the labs where people work in biology at MIT right now, you'll find that they spend about 50% of their time just manipulating the DNA in order to produce the molecule they want needed to do the experiment they actually want to do. So it takes them 50% of their time just to get to the beginning of their experiment because they're spending all of that time cutting and pasting DNA. If you gave them the equivalent of an inkjet printer for DNA synthesis, we'll call this the stinkjet printer that prints DNA, um, their experimental work would go twice as fast. So what are the positive consequences of having the entire biological research community being twice as effective? Um, does that remove some of our vulnerabilities that we can now imagine? Right, so that we're not as worried as we are today about hemorrhagic fevers. So that's a really tricky question to answer. I think if we don't think about um, uh, the 1% misuse possibility, it's certainly conceivable that that would happen. I expect, let me zoom out a little bit and come at this from a different perspective. I expect that this technology will be misapplied, um, actively misapplied. And I think it would be irresponsible to have a conversation about the technology without acknowledging that fact. In the same way that if we were talking about computer security, we wouldn't start our conversation by going, there will be no more computer viruses. And we're going to address the problem of computer security from that premise. I believe that the technology will be actively misapplied to cause harm. I don't think that's going to happen soon. I think that'll happen decades from now. Um, and so in that context, the Sorry, question, why do you think it won't happen soon? Could you just, well, because maybe I don't it's not think it's, I don't, effective enough? It's still slightly expensive. It's a little bit esoteric. Here we are talking about it. Uh, so you could all go build DNA synthesizers. <laughs> um, um, but it's not that easy yet. Um, if you go back to how you set up some of these questions 30 years ago, when it became possible to use recombinant DNA molecules to splice in toxins into bacteria and whatnot. I can't remember the name of the newspaper in Cambridge, but uh, whatever the equivalent of the metro is, uh, the subway newspaper, the daily subway newspaper ran a cover story that uh, featured, you know, clone botulinum toxin at home in your kitchen um, and explained how you would do that. Um, now, so far as I know, nobody actually went out and did that. And that could have been a nice 1% misuse of recombinant DNA technology. So the question is, why didn't that happen? And it wasn't that the technology was controlled in any super prescriptive way. Rather, uh, if you looked at the bias of individuals' intent throughout our society, the vast majority of people chose to deploy the technology constructively. Um, and so the question for me that comes out of this first uh, issue being raised is, what actions do we need to take, if any, to make sure that the uh, uh, development and application of synthesis technology in this case is overwhelmingly constructive, mm. right? Um, worldwide. worldwide, right? So, so let me let me follow up on that. Let Just me, yes, sir. Uh, for, for those of you who read Technology Review, the feature cover article this month is on the Russian uh, presumed misuse of biotechnology, yeah. and it's. It's, it's worth reading in this context because the, the, the frightening thing, I think, to many of us is uh, uh, 
and I don't believe everything Technology Review writes, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, the misuse can be much more devastating than, than atomic bombs yeah, so if it ever works. Thank you for bringing that up. So let's talk about that. I, I consider that article to be a huge disappointment um, um, because it's a pessimistic article. It simply raises appropriately that uh, the United States failed to uh, uh, be aware of the weapons program in the Soviet Union. After, in the Nixon administration, we publicly agreed to stop our own weapons program, the Soviets apparently continued on. And now that we've discovered some of this after the fact, as the Soviet Union has collapsed, we learned that the things that people were at least talking and imagining, talking about and imagining, were quite horrifying. Right? The idea that you could engineer a bacteria so that when somebody had an infection and you treated it with a drug, that drug would then trigger the actual second infection that would kill you. Um, so sort of a bait and switch pathogen. You don't really want to spin up a lot of uh, conversations about how to make biology worse. Nature's already doing a pretty good job at that. Um, and if we tried to make it better, I bet we could, but is that really what you want to do? The problem with the technology review article um, is that it just stops with raising all the alarm. And, and it doesn't say, well, OK, why do we have risks in biology at all? What are the reasons for that? And we're at MIT, and we're here in Cambridge, and let's think about how we'd solve those problems. We need to get better at detecting agents in the environment. We need to get better at analyzing them. We need to get better at responding to them, developing drugs. Uh, the idea that we're developing vaccines for uh, influenza by culturing stuff in eggs is unbelievable to me. That's horribly slow. Um, I want to imagine a world where I can detect an agent in 24 hours, figure it out, and deliver a therapeutic within another 24 hours. Those are some technical problems. How do we deliver those solutions? And so, you know, and, oh, by the way, I've been in communication with the editor at Tech Review about that article and, and think that we have to push the conversation towards that end. Back to your point about internationalization of the work. Um, it's not the case that synthesis technology is only getting developed here in Kendall Square. Um, the raw materials, uh, which are derived from sugarcane, are not produced commercially in the United States in any significant quantities. They're produced exclusively to first approximation in South Korea and China. Um, they're cheap, right? They're based on sugarcane. So for $800, you can buy enough raw materials to construct 30 copies of every human genome on the planet. Um, the companies that do this are based in, in basically go to Google, a web search engine, type in gene synthesis, and pick a capital city somewhere, and you'll find probably a company. The best named one, I think, is Tech Dragon in Hong Kong. Um, so you could go to their website and order some DNA. So if you're now in charge of governance of this technology in the United States, um, there's some very tricky questions to work through. Do you require licensing of synthesizers? Could you actually regulate the technology in a way that doesn't result in the creation of a black market or total offshoring of the technology. Not, not clear that we have crisp answers to that right now. Could, could, does anybody want to come back on that? Or Because I'm keen to yeah, get, please. Uh, all of the money in the US is going into biotechnology research to use this positively, not negatively. That doesn't mean there isn't some negative use someplace. But we are putting billions of dollars into the positive end of it, the 99% positive use. And I think that deserves the attention. Yeah. But if, and, if we can, and if we can illuminate you know, what the 1% is, not in service of stimulating paranoia and fear, but rather going, let's recognize what the actual challenges are and address them. Right? Then, the, then the organized 99% will, will, should win out. Right? But the issue of concern, going back to the Tech Review article, is if our paranoia results in this remilitarization of biology um, in the US or outside of the US, then with an organized group, you could actually you know, cause a lot of trouble. And you definitely want to stop that from happening. Can we um, move on, therefore, to the question of your aunts? Right. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is, um, you don't need to say more about them in particular. No, 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 you know, no, no, it's no, the, really no. the so, issues so, they were raising. So I, so if I were to be honest and, and say, why am I interested in this really? Um, I started by uh, modeling natural biological systems, and um, where you try and use a computer program to describe what's going to happen when the biological system does something. right? Um, and my models oftentimes turned out to not work. 
I would use my model to make a prediction, and I'd go in the lab, do the experiment, and something else would happen. Um, and that's not comfortable if you're an engineer, right? It's sort of like, I'm going to build a building, I design the building, it falls down. Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, why my models were failing. And I came to uh, a lot of conclusions, but the one that was most interesting that set me down the path uh, that puts me here tonight is, is the idea that um, natural biological systems are evolved, and evolution does not select for designs that are easy for human beings to understand and interact with. No. Um, and I thought that if I wanted to understand biological systems, I should be building them, because they'd be easier to understand. Um, and so I now look at natural biological systems with a critic's eye, going, huh, not so sure about that. Um, so that's me being honest. And there's a mismatch there between the expectations of my ants and my own uh, sense of reality. Um, so if your ants were Darwinians, they could reply, couldn't they? Because they, maybe they are, for all I know. But they could say, well, but what natural selection has favored is designs that, as it were, work robustly Correct. in a range of plausible natural environments over a geological time. And what confidence would we have, therefore, that the designs dreamt up in a short period of time in a lab would do the same? To start, probably no confidence, right? But it's a learning process. Um, and so the most radical thing I could say, I'm not actively promoting this, but just to sketch it out, um, all natural biological systems are subject to two powerful constraints on their design. They have to descend directly from one generation to the next, yeah. physically. And during that reproduction process, there are errors or mistakes. Right? And that's the, the underlying mechanisms that let evolution go. <clears throat> but if you think about it from the context of a designer, that's a hard problem to solve. How do you design a machine that can make a copy of itself and detect errors and evolve and stuff like that? None of the machines that we're using in this room um, are of that form. Even though they look incredibly complicated, imagine if this thing also had to make a copy of itself and find mistakes when it copied itself and whatnot. Um, so now I could take a biological system, I could sequence its genome, and I'm working up at the information level, and I could do design, and I could change, and I could evolve it yeah. according to my own intentions. Yeah. And then I can recompile it. And now I've just got the next generation. And I've decoupled evolution from the physical constraints of direct descent and replication with error, yeah. which I suggest, or su suspect rather, is going to lead to much simpler designs, because you don't have to solve these additional problems, and it's going to be easier to understand. And, and also, if, if I may say, but I'm interested in what other people may say, there's also another related constraint on evolution, which is that every generation in this sequence, the long sequence to get to the end result, must work. Correct. So there must be lots of small incremental changes, each of which are functional, whereas Correct. maybe the designer like you can put together lots of stuff that doesn't work until it's all configured in just the right way, and then it might. So you can make big leaps yeah, so in a way that evolution yeah. cannot do. Correct. Right. So, but just to be clear, this is, this is you know, extraordinarily controversial, widely deployed. I'm not promoting it. As a scientist, as a researcher, I suspect that this is true. Um, to say it and make light of things and not to get in trouble, but to say it anyway, right? You know, if you're thinking about intelligent design from the context of an engineer working about, really intelligent design would have documentation, basically, <laughs> is, what I'm, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so where are, the manu where are the manuals? Is that what you're asking? Right. Okay. I, I wasn't intending to go in that direction, but okay. <laughs> Fine. Please. I was just curious. I was just curious when you're talking about uh, these evolutionary organisms, I guess if you're going to design one, would you have to design evolution out? Otherwise, you'd have a machine that would kind of tweak, vary around uh, what you wanted it to do? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, that's the most interesting area of research, I think, in biological engineering going forward. We don't know how to design evolving machines, because we've never had a substrate where we have reproducing evolving machines. In biology, we do. Uh, to a first approximation, this isn't absolutely true, because some folks in computer science have been working. But to a first approximation, nobody in engineering has been working on the design of evolving machines. Von Neumann started working on it towards the end of his life and ran out of time. Um, so it's, it's an open, uh, largely an open area of research. But yes, you'd like to, it's like a spec on a project. You'd like to, somebody would say, well, make me a machine that doesn't evolve, or make me a machine that does evolve. OK, so we need to figure out how to do the full spectrum. How about software? Software. 
Well, yeah, so, so uh, John Koza and other people have been using genetic programming and genetic algorithms to evolve uh, uh, electronic circuits and software. Um, but interestingly, they've not been able to figure out how to evolve such systems in ways that are then understandable by humans. Um, and so that's going to be the trick. So let me put that qualification on it. Sorry, did, did everybody hear that? I didn't actually. Could you, could you say it again? Go on. I just said the self-learning systems. Yeah, so I, I, I yeah, yeah, fair enough. So do we want to go to the, the other page? The page that you found easier. Well, I'm, ki I'm kidding. Yes, so someone has asked, or one group has asked, what is your business venture, this uh, uh, startup company that you mentioned to us? At the so beginning. maybe I could do that one and the second from the bottom, which is the why now. OK, um, why now, yeah. So So I spent, so, so the chemistry of synthesis has been around since 1982, phosphoramidite chemistry. Um, uh, yet there's been no investment in uh, 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 the process of synthesis of long fragments of DNA, right? So if you compare and contrast that to, say, sequencing, which is another foundational technology that lets you read out DNA, there's been tremendous investment in that over the last 20 years. So starting in about 1998 to 1999, I worked with um, uh, a number of uh, program managers at the federal government to try and start up programs uh, sponsored by the government to improve synthesis technology. And I failed absolutely. Um, there was one existing program that was funded, and I actually helped get that canceled. Um, so over a period of six years, I was not able to convince or make arguments uh, to get uh, investment in synthesis technology. Two years ago, uh, the venture capital community in the United States decided that it was an important technology and made an investment um, across a couple companies, maybe about $50 million. It's now the largest sole investor of synthesis in synthesis to technology development in the world. Uh, there's still no federal investment. Hmm. The reason I'm involved with this company in Kendall Square called Codon is because they are the only people who are investing directly in this foundational technology, which I believe is of critical importance to both the science of biology and enabling uh, to biological engineering. I'm also involved with the company so that I can help make sure that it's developed in a way that's constructive. Um, What's their market? Their market is, uh, their zeroth order market is, remember, about 50% of people's time in biology labs is spent manipulating DNA via conventional technologies just to get the material needed to do an experiment. If you can provide that uh, as an on-demand service instead, people will pay, right? right. Because you're freeing them uh, of labor costs. Uh, so why now? A lot of this technology has been around for 20 years. Partly it's been lack of investment until recently, mm. um, at least with respect to synthesis. But with the other ideas, standardization, abstraction, decoupling, these engineering ideas, these have only come up much more recently, um, as I'm aware. Um, around MIT. Uh, there's enough people hmm. around MIT who remember what engineering disciplines were like before they existed or as they got going. <laughs> I didn't know about William Sellers and standardization of screw threads until yes. I heard of it from Tom Knight right, in That's electrical engineering and computer science. That's right? I didn't know about abstraction until Jerry Sussman you know, started teaching me about it. Um, and so I don't think that even though we've had 30 years of genetic engineering, the communities that have been investing in it have come largely from the life sciences and not from the, the traditional engineering communities. As you see those folks come in, they're largely declaring that there is no engineering in biology yet. This is an unsatisfying state of affairs. And we have to start by stealing all of these past lessons from other engineering disciplines, adapting them, considering whether or not they're relevant to this new physical substrate. There is, a, there is a sense that I have, partly having watched uh, what used to be called biotechnology, uh, develop in the 80s and 90s. There is a sense that something wasn't quite working the way it should have been at that time. Uh, and a lot of high hopes were in, uh, and presumably a lot of money was invested yeah. in areas which, not all of which have failed, but not all of which, it's fair to say, have really yielded the kinds of uh, fruits that people at that time were hoping. Do you think it's because there wasn't the right mix of biology and engineering back then to make it work? There's that, but also the science of biology is still relatively young, right? We're 70 years past the arguments 
that led to the founding of molecular biology yeah. from Warren Weaver and colleagues. Um, um, and so 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have the sequences of genomes, right? So you didn't have the low-level machine language. So there's a lot of things that are coming together. I, I, think, I think the advances in the foundational scientific understanding can't be underestimated. Right. What about the folk who asked these questions or raised these issues? Is there things you want to say? Please, could you use a mic? I'm sorry, we've got, we've got, I beg your pardon, we've got somebody there and then you. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about uh, material science and uh, miniaturization. Has that had any impact? Yeah. <laughs> so, for example, with synthesis chemistry, right, if you can synthesize fragments of DNA in smaller volumes, you get uh, increases in, in cost efficiency and so on and so forth. Uh, if you can develop small scale uh, reactors for culturing cells and then measuring their behavior, you know, um, there's, lots of, there's lots of connections between uh, miniaturization of me me mechanical objects and, and novel materials and instrumentation. What's that? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, there's somebody wanting, who's been wanting to get in from the back, and then our friend here. You mentioned several researchers, all drawn from the realm of computer science and electrical engineering. What is it about that discipline, which itself was born out of physics, uh, that leads to those, or has led to that, that abstraction outlook and so forth, and applying that to ever, ever newer substrates, whether it's tubes or transistors or now? I'm not the right, that's a great question. I'm not the right person to answer that if I had to, because I'm not, I'm not from that tradition. I wonder if it's not simply that that's, if you look back uh, across the emergence of engineering from the natural sciences, that that's more recent than, say, civil engineering. Um, and so there's still some people around who remember that, right? Or that field is, is, is more recently reinvented itself in some way. So for example, um, in, in, in electronics, you can look to the uh, Carver, Mead, Lynn Conway experiences in the late 1970s, mid late 1970s, early 80s, where they uh, implemented rules that enabled very large scale integrated electronic systems. I'm able to go talk to Lynn Conway, right, and ask her, what were you thinking about, right? How did you make that transition? Um, I'm not able to go talk to William Sellers. Um, and so, I, you know, that's a, that's a very naive off the top answer, but maybe it's just you know, te temporal proximity. Please, you wanted to say something. A um, couple of things. One, I want to come back to the question that you chose not to answer. When you said that, when the, you ask why now, and you said because they chose to make an investment now, so I'm going to come back to it in the same way. Why did they choose to make an investment now? And the other question I have for you I is think, yeah. um, somebody who wrote a thesis in this institution proven that if we use the laws of aerodynamics, flies should not be able to fly, or bumblebee, I think. Um, do you think as we go deeper into biological engineering, we will discover a lot more of those uh, contradictions? Okay, so why are the, yeah, venture, so cap why are the venture capitalists yeah, yeah. investing now, and will we discover surprises and contradictions in biology as we go further? Thank you for catching my lack of response to the first question. Um, Well, so let me, let me come at it this way. Um, biology is really cool. Um, we're not very good at engineering biology. It's painful, tedious, and slow. Um, what you see is you see some of the best engineers in the world coming into biology. I want to do something. I want to make a DNA computer, right? That happened 10, 15 years ago. Um, um, I want to do this. I want to do that, right? Um, and, and you come in, you're coming in from electrical engineering or computer science or civil engineering or mechanical engineering or chemical engineering or whatever, um, and you try and do something, and it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible, right? It takes you six months to make the molecule of DNA uh, that you need just to go do the first step in your experiment. Um, and most smart engineers, when they encounter that, go, huh. I should go do something else, make lots of money, come back in 10 years when the foundational technologies are better, and I'll be able to do something that's cool. Um, and I'll be independently wealthy then too, right? <laughs> um, so, so to get back to a direct answer to your question, I don't think there's any one thing I can point to, but other than 
a combination of foundational technologies, right? The fact that MIT now has the registry of standard biological parts. And oh, by the way, it's horrible. Like it's, it's a very lame pilot project. But that as a little resource makes things incrementally easier. And so now when we have uh, undergraduates and graduate students coming in, it takes them two months instead of eight months, right, to do a project. And, and somehow over the last two to four years, we've crossed this threshold where the pain level associated with doing the work is, is, is low enough such that the modest incremental rewards that come back sustain the culture. Um, I don't think it's any one thing, but it's that, that transition. Plus at a place like MIT, we're fortunate in engineering to be able to say, we're not very good. We don't know how to do this. Um, um, help, you know, let's figure it out. And, and, and acceptance of that means it's okay to stumble for a long time. Um, your second question. Bumblebees and how they fly. All over the place. Um, I think the worst case scenario for, for uh, investing in this is we'll discover lots of things we don't know. Right? That's the worst case scenario. <laughs> we won't get any of the engineering applications to work. I'll never get an 8-bit counter working inside yeast or mouse or whatever. Um, but I'll find out why. Maybe it's because the counter is evolving and I can't control it. I can't figure that problem out. Um, or maybe it's something else. So, so that's, as soon as I realized that personally, I was completely comfortable with retasking my entire life's research agenda over to engineering. Because even if I fail over and over again as an engineer, the science that comes out, it's, it's, it's testing of understanding by building is the, probably the most direct, shortest, and powerful path for demonstrating what you know and what you don't know. Um, if you have a collection, if you have some basal collection, right? So we can, what's that? If you don't kill yourself, yes. Please, here. In the non -bio Could you just use the microphone and then everybody can hear? Sure. Bioengineered world, we're losing species to extinction uh, fairly regularly. Um, can this technology help us keep our biodiversity? You can imagine that's true. Uh, it's not something that uh, we could deliver anytime soon. Um, but if you can construct organisms, right, then the diversity of things you construct is limited uh, in accordance with your understanding. Uh, Freeman Dyson, uh, in a very nice article in Technology Review, uh, published in March of 2005, the title of the article is The Darwinian Interlude. Um, Freeman's completely optimistic about the advent of this technology and its application and distribution. He talks about what the Philadelphia Flower Show looks like when there's you know, um, full-on uh, garage biotechnology um, greenhouse <laughs> biotechnology. And he also talks about the lizard, the reptile show in San Diego, right? What those two um, 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 events are going to look like when you have, when you have full on garage biotechnology. And he thinks it's going to be wonderful, right? So if you get to that end point, then maybe. But at the moment, I don't think so. I've got lots of hands waving, but the one I saw first was here, then, then here. Please, if you could just wait for the mic. I'm sorry, someone will bring a microphone even as I speak. There we go. Uh, you seem to have a hidden assumption, or, or maybe I don't understand, uh, that if you get an itty bitty piece of this, that's all you have to do. And it must be issues of how do you manufacture large quantities once you have the itty bitty piece. Actually, you really only usually need an itty bitty piece, um, because one of the cool features of living technology is it makes more copies of itself, right? Usually for pretty cheap. Um, and so, and so for some applications, you really only need a small amount. For therapeutic applications, right, if you needed to make lots of a particular DNA molecule as a component in a vaccine, then it's a totally different story. Yeah. Please. Sorry? Sorry. To a first approximation, yes. <laughs> Maybe that often means with, with, with people doing really inventive things, it means I can just about imagine how it could be done. Uh, uh, two questions by extension. <clears throat> Can we recreate by, by having a catalog of the DNA of every living organism on the Earth, which is not inconceivable, could we recreate extinct species? Uh. And the other question is, what, what are the implications of this with respect to length of life? I don't know anything about aging. Um, to the extent that we can control it by manipulation of genetic information, it should be under our direct control because we should be able to design and build genomes according to our specification, right? My lab's already done that once for a little 
uh, pilot uh, model organism, about 40,000 base pairs. So if we could actually understand it, either via conventional science or via perturbation-driven science, then maybe we could do something. Um, in terms of bringing back, this is following up on the earlier question, you know, bringing back extinct species or constructing new species, um, anything that's genetically encoded seems like we can do, right? So let me give you some facts on the ground existence proofs, right? So my lab in the last four years redesigned a very small genome. It's 40,000 units long, 40,000 base pairs long. We're billions of base pairs long. Um, that took us about three years of work. But we did very fine-grained engineering of a genome. A group in Japan a couple months ago from Mitsubishi published an engineering project where they took the genome of a marine microorganism called Sinica cystis and combined it with the genome of a common bacteria, Bacillus subtilis, making a composite organism that was 3.2 million base pairs from this organism and 4.5 million base pairs from B. subtilis. The composite organism is 7.7 .7 million base pairs. Yeast is about 12 million base pairs. So that's sort of where, that was a seven-year project. Um, so that's sort of where the limits of the technology are right now. So if we wanted to resurrect an extinct bacteria, I can imagine being able to do that in the next decade, right? But if you were going to resurrect a dinosaur, you know, that's, that's still very much in the realm of, of fantasy. Yeah. So Jurassic Park was fiction, right? Okay. Please. You mentioned garage biotechnology. I mean, is that notion of extremely distributed synthetic biology uh, in any way analogous to what happened in the personal computer realm where the homebrew computer club in Silicon Valley birthed incredibly rapid, almost exponential development of software, of new computer systems, and so forth. Is there a homebrew synthetic biology movement afoot? Is this doable given the low-cost raw materials and synthetic so, so the, devices? The, the question, to turn that around, it's another good question. The question is, what are the um, initial conditions? What is the state of technology that's required to support widespread distribution, hacking, constructive hacking, garage biotechnology? Right? It hasn't come into existence in the last 30 years. Synthesis by itself will not bring it into existence, I expect. Because as soon as you have a synthesizer, the next problem you run into is, what do I want to synthesize? Right? So then you need to have collections of parts. Right? And so you could go back. The interesting thing to do would be to go back and say, what were the foundational technologies? What was the state of those technologies accessible to people building computers and then software on top of it that de-skilled the process and made it painless enough that there was a reward to be gained from doing something constructive and fun in your garage? Um, we're already at the point right now with our early stage registry of standard biological parts where 10th graders will send in an email going, how do I make a new bio brick, one of these parts, right? They're not yet doing that much with them, but there's no reason to expect that we couldn't have widespread wholesale distribution of collections of tens of thousands of components at a cost of approximately nothing because we get more DNA for free once we have one copy of it. Um, and that would support a lot of engineering in, in people's homes. Okay, I'm going to give the last question to somebody over here, uh, and I'm afraid that will be the last one because we're running out of time. Please. I'd just like to make a comment. Like yourself, I was in research 30 years ago. The last 30 years I've spent in biotechnology, starting companies and trying to fulfill research dreams. I think the thing we have to be cognizant of is the fact that there is a massive evolutionary force within the biotechnology, which is the venture capitalist and his goals. His goals are financial making money. And I go back to your question there, why now? And you asked, why are we making flu in eggs? Vaccines are a very poor investment. A successful vaccine erodes its own market and dis dis destroys it. Influenza is a highly successful vaccine because it's a very poor vaccine and needs to be replenished every year at tremendous profit. That is why we are now still using a technology from 1940 where we could make a vaccine for flu that could eradicate epidemics and pandemics. So the evolutionary driver of the greed of the venture capitalist is a very important component in thinking about how we advance these technologies hmm. in the future. I agree completely. But just to add to that for a second, right, there's tremendous conversation. I don't know that it's strategic, 
right, within the government to consider how we would change some of the economic forces uh, around vaccine development. I don't believe that they're effective based on what I'm seeing. But, yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, look, we could clearly go on for a lot longer, and they... Uh, they are uh, developing recombinant DNA uh, vaccines, so we could go on for a long time. Yeah. Um, but it's very A lot of people are very optimistic about... A small number of people are very optimistic about DNA vaccines in working in humans. And if something like that worked, that'd be spectacular. Um, but, you know, I'd love to see it. Well, as I said, uh, we could obviously go on a lot longer, and it's only for reasons of fairness to our speaker and to those of you who have to get away that we, that we draw to an end. There's clearly a lot of exciting issues here, and, and I know you'd all want to agree with me in wishing Drew Endy well as he works on those 99% of beneficial uses of synthetic biology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.